So I'm going to be talking about quantum algorithms for Hamiltonian simulation. It seems like today's the simulating physical systems day. And um, how my talk's going to differ from the other talks is I'm just going to consider this problem very abstractly. Uh, so I'm not going to focus on any spe specific <laughs> physical system like you know, a condensed matter system or quantum chemistry or whatever. I'm just going to think of it as just a Hamiltonian. And we want to simulate the time dynamics of this Hamiltonian. Uh, one of the advantages of doing it this way is you, 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 when you throw away all these details, you know, often it's easier to design algorithms. You can clearly focus on what the problems are. And um, what I think of as the main benefit of thinking of this problem more abstractly is that it doesn't scare away computer scientists from working on this problem. OK. So and what I'm going to focus on in this talk is recent results and open problems. So there's been a lot of great progress in Hamiltonian simulation algorithms over the last couple of years, since 2013 or so. And it's been kind of hard to keep up, um, even for some of us who work in the area. So I thought it would be nice if I can overview what's happened over the last couple of years, give you some idea of uh, how these techniques work, and highlight what's, uh, what's still left to be done. OK, so just so we're all on the same page, let me just describe the general problem we're talking about. We're talking about the problem of simulating a physical system. Um, here's a classical example of it on, on the slide. But the general problem is I'll tell you what a system looks like right now, you, and you have to tell me what the system is going to look like after some time t. So I give you an initial state. I tell you how the system evolves um, in time, and you have to figure out the final state of the system. A classical example would be you drop a ball, and I'll give you the initial position and velocity, and you've got to figure out the position and velocity after some time t. OK, the quantum version of this problem, the one we're going to focus on in this talk, is the Hamiltonian simulation problem which very abstractly is just you're given a Hamiltonian H, which is just a 2 to the n by 2 to the n Hermitian matrix, where n is the number of qubits um, in your system. And you're given a time parameter and some error parameter epsilon, so that you don't have to get the answer exactly right. It's OK if you're off by epsilon. And you have to find a quantum circuit that implements the operator e to the minus iht. If you don't know what that operator is, it's just it describes the time evolution due to the Hamiltonian H of your system. So if your starting state is ket psi, after time t, the state will be transformed to e to the minus iht times ket psi. Okay, in this abstract version of the problem, you don't even need to understand where this Hamiltonian is coming from. It's just, or who gives it to you, whatever. It's just some, it's a Hermitian matrix. Um, a special case of this problem that's interesting for applications and relevant in physics is the local Hamiltonian simulation problem which is the same problem, but now I, I'm going to tell you something more about the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is local. And formally, what I mean is it's a k-local Hamiltonian. And, and what that means is you can write the matrix H as a sum of matrices Hj. And each of these Hj only act on k qubits at a time. So, so remember, this Hamiltonian is on n qubits. n is large. And you want to think of k as a constant, like let's say 3. So it's a sum of terms. And each of those terms only acts on 3 qubits at a time. So this is a very. Uh, nice description of a Hamiltonian. And it's a very, it captures a very sp special class of Hamiltonians. Like, you can't do this for all Hamiltonians. Um, of course, like there's, there's just way too many Hamiltonians. So this is, we're narrowing down on a special class of Hamiltonians we're interested in because these Hamiltonians actually come up uh, in practice. OK, and why should we study this problem? Maybe everybody really knows the answer to this question, but I'll just tell you why. This was the original application of quantum computers back when Feynman proposed this back in the day. That's maybe not a great reason to study it just because Feynman thought it was cool. But more interestingly, um, a fraction of the world's computational power is devoted to solving this problem today on classical machines. Um, it's still one of the best applications of quantum computing. You know, when people ask us, um, so what are we going to do when we have quantum computers in the, in the future, when we have these large quantum computers, what are we going to do with them? You know, maybe we'll factor numbers, but it's not clear what, what application that'll have. But this is something we can really do, and it's going to be useful and interesting. And finally, this problem, or when you phrase it appropriately, uh, will almost never have a classical polynomial time algorithm because it's complete for the complexity class BQP, which captures a set of problems that are efficiently solved on a quantum computer. So in other words, if there was a classical polynomial time algorithm for solving this problem, then every problem that can be solved by a quantum computer can be solved efficiently on classical computers. So you know, for example, you have factoring algorithms, polynomial time classical factoring algorithms. And we don't think that's going to happen. So, so we're safe. We, we shouldn't worry about classical computers scooping us on this problem uh, in, in all generality. OK, and before I move on to talking about this problem, let me just 
explain the difference between the simulation problem and the problem of computing ground state energies. Because these are problems that are often confused and uh, people often come to me and they're talking about the second problem when I'm talking about the first. So this talk is going to be about the first problem, the simulation problem, as I described on the last slide. And just big picture wise, the difference between these two problems is the first problem is the problem of simulating the time dynamics of a system. It's, it's the problem of predicting the behavior of a system. And just abstractly speaking, this problem is usually easy. Because if you have enough resources to simply mimic the behavior just, just of the system that you're trying to simulate, you can if you can just copy the system, you can always simulate its behavior. So for example, if you just want to compute the output of a circuit on some given input x, you can always do this. You take the input, look at all your gates, compute the outputs of every gate individually, and so on, till you're at the end of the circuit. And now you know the output of the Boolean circuit on this input. On the other hand, computing the ground state energy is more like a global optimization problem. You're asking some kind of uh, global property of the system. And these questions tend to be really hard, like NP hard or QMA hard and so on. And as a classical example, it's like asking, I'll give you a Boolean circuit, and is there any input that makes the circuit output one? So you see it's a global optimization problem. You have to search over all possible inputs. So the problem on the right is usually very hard. Problem on the left, usually easy if your, your computer has the resources to simulate the system. So uh, classical versions of this problem will be in P. Quantum versions of this problem should be in BQP. That's kind of what you expect. OK, just wanted to make that quick note so there's no confusion about what problem we're talking about. OK, so let's come back to Hamiltonian simulation. So the local Hamiltonian simulation problem, as I talk, explained before, we're focusing on the specific class of Hamiltonians that are interesting, k-local Hamiltonians. So something you can observe when you look at this matrix H, so as I was saying, you, can, you just think of this matrix H abstractly. It's an exponentially large matrix. It's 2 to the n by 2 to the n. What you'll notice is if the Hamiltonian that you're considering is sparse, is a local, then the matrix is sparse. And what I mean by sparse is that even though the matrix has 2 to the n possible entries in a row, at most d of them are non-zero, where d is something like linear in the number of terms that you're summing over. So this Hamiltonian is the sum of m terms, and d is like order m. We're thinking of k as a constant, so it doesn't matter that there's a 2 to the k over there. So these matrices are extremely sparse, because you want to think of the number of terms in this Hamiltonian as being polynomial in n. So for example, if it's just uh, each term is just three local, at most you can have like something like n cubed terms in your Hamiltonian. So it's a matrix of exponential size, but there's very few non-zero entries in it. And furthermore, these non-zero entries appear at structured locations. It's a structured sparse matrix. It's not just any old sparse matrix that has d non-zero entries in a given row or column, but you can figure out where the non-zero entries are. And once you make this observation, it's easy to generalize this problem to just the problem of simulating a Hamiltonian that's sparse. So we even throw away this local structure. All we care about is the fact that the Hamiltonian is sparse. And formally, I'll define the problem as you're given a d sparse Hamiltonian, where d refers to the number of non-zero entries in any row or column. And how are you given this Hamiltonian? You're given this Hamiltonian via some kind of uh, oracle or a classical algorithm or a circuit, just some efficient procedure that when you feed it x and y will tell you the x non-zero entry in row y. So this is a completely abstract way of capturing this Hamiltonian simulation problem for this very general class of Hamiltonians, sparse Hamiltonians, that captures local Hamiltonians and also captures other things that are not local, and is a class of Hamiltonians that we would like to simulate on a quantum computer. So sparse Hamiltonian simulation. And just before I start talking about what we know about this problem, why did I generalize to sparse Hamiltonians? Well, one thing, uh, one reason to generalize to sparse Hamiltonians is because, well, all the known simulation algorithms for local Hamiltonians just readily gen generalize to sparse Hamiltonians. Um, in the sense that you just look at the algorithm and you see what it's doing, and then you're like, oh, this would also work for sparse Hamiltonians, so why not study the more general problem? I mean, this gives you more power, like you're able to express a richer class of systems. Uh, so, you know, why not study this richer class of systems? Uh, more interestingly, um, I've been told that these kinds of Hamiltonians actually do arise even for physical systems, and in particular, things like where a Hamiltonian being a sum of products of poly operators. So this is not a local operator because it's, uh, you can think of a poly operator on every single qubit, but these kinds of Hamiltonians arise in uh, fermionic systems when you apply the Jordan-Wigner transformation, for example. Um, so that's another reason you might care, because these Hamiltonians might actually arise in modeling physical systems. Uh, perhaps the most interesting reason 
or one of the more interesting things from my perspective is this has algorithmic applications. So Hamiltonian simulation is such a rich and general technique, you can use it as a subroutine in quantum algorithms. So for designing quantum algorithms for solving other problems like evaluating game trees or NAND trees, uh, solving linear systems of e equations, this is the HHL algorithm, um, solving the glue trees problem, this is one of the first um, examples of an exponential speed up by a continuous time quantum walk. Uh, what's common to all of these algorithms is they all use Hamiltonian simulation as a subroutine, and um, all of them crucially use the fact that the Hamiltonian is sparse, and uh, usually it's not local. So we need this generalization to sparse Hamiltonians. And finally, one of the reasons I really like thinking about this general problem of sparse Hamiltonian simulation is you can now model the problem as a, a, as a query complexity problem. So what that means is you can count the number of uses of this oracle, the one that's telling you the non-zero entries of your Hamiltonian. And once you map a computational problem to a, a query complexity problem where you can count the number of times you use some kind of oracle, this makes it, well, A, first possible to even prove lower bounds, because um, in general we're, uh, by we I mean like just complexity theorists are terrible at proving concrete gate lower bounds for anything. So it's really hard to prove this kind of thing in general, but once you uh, go to this model of query complexity, at least we can prove lower bounds, you can prove upper bounds. It also abstracts away a lot of the details. You can forget about uh, specific implementation issues and architecture issues and all that stuff and just focus on the core of the problem. Uh, okay, so that's kind of why I think this problem is interesting and it's nice to model it this way. And I think uh, a lot of other people think this is also the case because there's been a tremendous amount of work in, on sparse Hamiltonian simulation and all these works generally consider this general case of just simulating the time dynamics of a sparse Hamiltonian. Okay, so let me get to, that concludes the intro part of my talk. Let me get to this thing that I said that there's been a lot of interesting work and I wanna give you a rough idea of what's going on in this field. And you know, what are the new algorithms we've been developing and what do they roughly look like? I mean, I won't have time to actually go into the details of any algorithm, but I'll try to give you a high level perspective of how these algorithms are designed. All the known Hamiltonian simulation algorithms, either for sparse or local Hamiltonians, doesn't matter, essentially fit into two paradigms. There's just two classes of Hamiltonian simulation algorithms. And I call these uh, the divide and conquer algorithms and the quantum walk algorithms. I, I hope that's readable. So there's just two classes of algorithms and I'm gonna explain the high level idea behind both of these algorithms. So how do you solve the Hamiltonian simulation problem using divide and conquer algorithms? So let me start with that. So in the divide and conquer algorithm paradigm, as the name probably suggests, we're gonna divide the problem into smaller pieces. And what that means is you decompose the Hamiltonian H into a sum of easier Hamiltonians. And what, what does easier mean? Easier just means that you're able to solve the Hamiltonian simulation problem for this Hamiltonian. So for example, if your Hamiltonian is already local, then you've been given a decomposition as a sum of local terms. And a local Hamiltonian, like uh, each of those pieces, HJ only acts on let's say three qubits at a time, so you are able to solve the Hamiltonian simulation problem on this three qubit Hamiltonian, because it's just three qubits, you know, whatever. It's some circuit on a constant number of bits, so you can just write down some unitary that does that. So this is an example of a situation where you've broken up the problem into small problems that you can solve. Um, more generally, for sparse Hamiltonians, there is an algorithm that can uh, decompose an arbitrary sparse Hamiltonian to sum of order d squared simpler Hamiltonians, where the simpler Hamiltonian is one sparse. And what one sparse means is just every row or column is at most one non-zero entry. That's another class of very simple Hamiltonians that we can simulate. So the thing to notice over here is if your local Hamiltonian is D sparse, the decomposition that you're given already breaks it up into order D pieces, whereas for sparse Hamiltonians, we can only break it up into D squared pieces. That's the best algorithms we have. And this is also one of the downsides of this divide and conquer approach. This causes all the known algorithms to have at least D squared complexity. And the, the optimal complexity is like, is, is order D. So uh, all the algorithms that I'll sketch in this divide and conquer paradigm, their scaling with the sparsity parameter will always be at least D squared, so they, they won't be optimal. Uh, but they have other benefits. So, and, uh, and, and in particular for local Hamiltonians, you don't face this issue of D squared. So maybe it doesn't matter if the Hamiltonian you, you're interested in is local. Okay, so this is just step one. Uh, you know, a, a divide and conquer algorithm uh, traditionally has two steps. Uh, the dividing part and then the, the conquering and you know, getting the final solution to the problem you actually wanted to solve. So it's great that you can 
simulate these individual pieces. That's fine. You can solve the problem on these smaller instances. But what do you do with these smaller solutions? And that's step two, which is just recombine these Hamiltonians. And the simplest method of recombining is um, what's you know, very well known in the community. Uh, and it's known by many different names. I'm just going to call it product formulas to avoid having like three people's name up there. But it's like often called Trotter formulas or uh, Lee Trotter formulas or Lee Suzuki formulas or whatever. Anyway, they're just formulas of the following type. They express the, the exponential of a sum of Hamiltonians as a product of their exponential. So let's say your Hamiltonian is broken up into three pieces, A, B, and C, and you want to simulate e to the minus i, a plus b plus c times t. Uh, this formula says that roughly what you can do is instead simulate a for time t over r, b for time t over r, and c for time t over r, and then just do this process r times. If you choose r to be large enough, the errors will be small. And of course, you have to compute what the errors are and so on to uh, formally prove a theorem. But uh, this idea works great, um, uh, especially when your Hamiltonian is local. And it has been the basis of all Hamiltonian simulation algorithms until, I don't know, five, I'm going to say 10 years ago. But more recently, in 2013 and 2016, new techniques were developed for doing this recombination step, which I'm not going to explain at this, at this point, but I'll, I'll get back to it in two slides. Uh, the first technique I like to call the linear combination of unitaries plus oblivious amplitude amplification, which I'll sometimes abbreviate by LCU plus OAA. And the second technique is something called quantum signal processing. So these are uh, techniques that are in gen uh, general better than product formulas, give you uh, better recombination methods, and give you better algorithms uh, in terms of their query complexity. Okay, so this is an overview of the first technique, divide and conquer. Break it up into pieces, solve the individual pieces, uh, recombine them using any one of these three techniques. Okay, the other thing you can do is use a second paradigm, which I call the quantum walk algorithms paradigm. And this one is probably easiest to explain with just uh, an example. I won't explain formally what's going on, but what you do is you come up with a quantum walk. It doesn't matter how, what this is or how it's constructed. It's just some operator W that you can implement as a quantum circuit. So forget about the details of how you come up with this W. It's just uh, some unitary that you know how to perform on your, on your quantum computer. And what's interesting about W is that it's diagonal in the same basis as H, but its eigenvalues are off by what you would like them to be. So, so let's just write down H, the Hamiltonian we're trying to simulate, in the basis in which it's diagonal, its eigenbasis. So it has some eigenvalues, lambda 1 through lambda n. Uh, what we want to solve is the Hamiltonian simulation problem. So what that means is we want to implement the unitary, which is e to the minus i lambda, e to the minus i h. Uh, and let's, let's say t equals 1, so forget about time. And the unitary will also be diagonal on the same basis that the Hamiltonian is diagonal, and the eigenvalues will get mapped. Lambda 1 will get mapped to e to the minus i lambda 1. That's great. U is your target unitary. This is the one you, that you want to implement. And the quantum walk gives you this other unitary, w, which is uh, um, I'm, I'm shoving some details under the rug. It doesn't really matter. It's essentially diagonal in the same basis except the eigenvalues are off from the ones you would like. What you would like is the eigenvalues to be e to the minus i lambda 1 for the first eigenvalue, but it's actually e to the minus i sine inverse of lambda 1. Also, we all have to worry about normalizing the Hamiltonian correctly so that the sine inverse function is defined and so on, but let's uh, forget about these details. The thing to remember is just the eigenvalues aren't what you want them to be. They're, they're different. It, it would be great if that was just e to the i lambda 1. Then you would be done. The walk operator itself would implement uh, the unitary that you're trying to, but it doesn't. OK, so that's great. So obviously, step two is going to be use this walk operator to get the unitary that you want. But let me point out one or two downsides of using this approach. Uh, the great thing is that this unitary w, the quantum walk, can be implemented using very few queries to our oracle, so just a constant number of queries. So that's great. The, the downside is it needs two n qubits to implement. So, so recall that your system was on n qubits. So the best algorithm would, be, would use exactly n qubits, like the, the size you need to represent the input and output. Um, so this is a downside. This uses n additional qubits, or n ancilla qubits. The other downside is it needs you to compute trigonometric functions in superposition. So you need to come up with quantum circuits that compute things like sine inverse and cosine inverse in superposition. This is not something you can do uh, like offline computation on a classical computer. In theory, you can compute trigonometric functions relatively straightforwardly. I mean, you have uh, linear time algorithms for doing so. But in practice, this is really hard, and the circuits are terrible. 
So if you're worried about actually implementing this, this is not, not so great. OK, so this is step one. I've given you an operator that almost does what you want, but it doesn't do exactly what you want. And you need to fix this. And step two is fixing the wrong phases. Again, there's three different ways to do it. The, the first way that was discovered is using this phase estimation algorithm. And it's, uh, it's kind of beautifully tailored for doing exactly this kind of thing. With phase estimation, what you can do is just read off the phases, figure out what the phases should have been, and correct them. Um, so that's, that's really nice. And it straightforwardly gives you an algorithm for doing this. And again, the other two ways of doing this are the two approaches I talked about on the previous slide, a linear combination unitary split of oblivious amplitude amplification and quantum signal processing. So uh, as before, there's three different ways of, that you can fix this issue as well. OK, so in both of these paradigms, what you saw is there's, in step two, there's two ways of implementing it that are, not, uh, that are not phase estimation or product formulas, which are these two methods of LCU plus OAA, as I've called it, and quantum signal processing. And I wanted to take just a minute to explain, or just give you a high level idea of what's going on. So it, these are uh, somewhat involved techniques, and I won't be able to give you any details, but maybe if you just can take away one slide about what these techniques do, uh, these are the real um, innovations in the last four or five years in Hamiltonian simulation. Like these are the techniques that have brought down the query complexity significantly from what we knew before. Okay, so the first technique, LCU plus uh, OAA, um, you can just think of it as allowing you to do a very simple operation. And what it allows you to do is, if the unitary that you're interested in implementing is called U, and you write it as a sum of unitaries VI with some coefficients AI, then this technique gives you a method of performing U if you have a, a way of performing VI. So in other words, if, if the VIs are easy to implement on your quantum computer, uh, maybe they have low, low query complexity, or they have low gate complexity, then you now have a method of performing U. So if you can write the unitary you're interested in as a linear combination of known, easy to implement unitaries, then you're good to go. That's kind of the uh, one sentence summary of what this technique does. And uh, in all of these approaches, what you do is you express the unitary that you're interested in, which is e to the minus iht, as a linear combination of easier unitaries. In the, in the divide and conquer approach, you would express it in terms of these pieces that you've broken it up into. In the um, quantum walk approach, you express it as powers of the quantum walk. OK, that's the first technique. And quantum signal processing solves this very interesting and general question, which is we have access to a unitary r of theta, uh, which is that diagonal unitary over there, for some unknown theta. So you don't know what theta is. So someone just gives you a circuit that implements r of theta, but you, you can't look at the circuit and figure out what theta is. And the question is, what kind of unitaries can you now perform using R of theta and uh, other gates of your choice? So the other gates you use are, of course, independent of theta because you don't know what theta is. So for example, we can perform this gate. Um, and that's because that's just R of theta squared. So you just you know, apply the gate twice. Now you can do that. Then you might ask, well, can we perform this gate over here? Which looks kind of like R of theta, but, but it's not the same gate. And um, if you think about it for a bit, you'll see that, yeah, you can perform this. All you do is you apply the poly x gate followed by r of theta, and you'll get this gate over here. Then you can ask, well, what about this gate over here? And you can figure it out. Actually, it turns out this gate is just a product of these two gates over here, so therefore you can still do it. But more generally, if I just give you some gate where all the entries are functions of theta, can you or can you not do this as a product of r thetas and theta independent gates? And if you can, then how many of them do you need? This is the general question answered by quantum signal processing, and it gives a full if and only if characterization of when this is possible. OK, so that's my half slide summary of what quantum signal processing is. Um, yeah, I hope that was beneficial, but I won't go into more details of how these things work. And on the next slide, what I can do is I can tell you what are these new algorithms we have. And if you, if you remember, I said there's two paradigms. And in each of those paradigms, there's three different ways of fixing the issue, whatever the, the problem was. And so that gives you six different Hamiltonian simulation algorithms. And these are all put up here on this slide. So the first column says, what paradigm does it use? Divide and conquer or quantum walks? And here's the complexity in terms of the three parameters we care about, the sparsity of the Hamiltonian, uh, the time that you want to simulate the Hamiltonian for, and the error parameter. So uh, you know, we want as low complexity as possible in all, of, all three of these parameters we care about. 
And until 2013 or so, the best algorithms were just the first two on this slide. Um, and as you can see, the, the one that's based on divide and conquer has a scaling in D that's more than D squared. As I said, that's an inherent limitation of this divide and conquer technique. Um, the second algorithm is better, except that its dependence on epsilon is worse. So it has square root of epsilon or in the denominator, whereas the other one has uh, an arbitrarily small power of epsilon. It's epsilon to one over two K, and you can take K to be a large, think of K as a very large number. And in 2013, we've, we discovered the first algorithms where the dependence on epsilon was only logarithmic. So this is really great. You, uh, if you want to have your output be precise to uh, epsilon, you only have to spend log of one or epsilon resources. This is the kind of complexity you, you want for algorithms. You know, for, for example, um, and if you're trying to compute some number like pi to precision epsilon, you want your algorithms to scale like log of one or epsilon, not like one or epsilon. Uh, so this was the first time we had Hamiltonian simulation algorithms that were extremely accurate. This one, as you can see, still has the D squared dependence because it's a divide and conquer algorithm. Um, later, there was an algorithm based on quantum walks that then fixes that and gets complexity that goes linear in sparsity, linear in time, and logarithmic in one or epsilon. And what's nice is <clears throat> a lower bound was also shown, showing that you cannot do better than D times T, and also you cannot do better than log of one or epsilon divided by log log one or epsilon. So it looks like that algorithm's pretty tight, um, except it's not because the lower bound has a sum of two things and the upper bound has a product of two things, like the product can be bigger. So there was some room for improvement and last year and this year, there were two new algorithms based on this quantum signal processing paradigm that improved the query complexities. And now you see they get this sum dependence and it looks pretty good. It looks like we've essentially reached the lower bound except it's off by a log log term. Uh, so let me, let me just focus on that for a second. Let me get rid of all these extraneous details. We have this lower bound that says that you need D times T plus log over log log one or epsilon complexity, whereas this algorithm achieves something that's a little worse, except it's not really, this is only the cleanest expression that I could fit over in that cell. The complexity of the algorithm is actually order Q, where Q is the smallest integer that satisfies this equation. So I don't have a closed form expression for this. I don't know how to express this. Um, in, in nicely in big O notation using just DT and one over epsilon, but this is the complexity. It's, it makes order Q queries where Q is the smallest integer satisfying that equation. What's perhaps even more interesting is that the lower bound matches this. So if you go look at these lower bounds, um, do a little more work, combine these two different lower bound techniques, work through the math, you get exactly the same equation. You get that you need omega Q queries where Q satisfies this exact same equation. So this very nasty function of Q that I don't even know a closed form expression for is the right answer for what is the query complexity of sparse Hamiltonian simulation. So this question is now answered. Uh, if you're, all you care about is what is the query complexity of this problem. So that's really nice and it's also nice that the answer is not something simple that looks like this, it's some complicated thing, and that just really is the right answer. It's not uh, an artifact of our analysis techniques being weak or anything. This is just the right answer. Okay, so that's kind of what's been going on in the last couple of years. Um, that's good, I have like 15 minutes left, including questions. So I'm, what I'm gonna do is, let me just say what's left. It seems like at this point the story is concluded and well, we've solved everything. The, there's nothing interesting left in query complexity. We should now focus on actual Hamiltonians that you care about for your desired application. Uh, but there's a couple of problems that I think are interesting and open. So let me focus on them for the next couple of minutes. Okay, so the first one is, let's get back to this thing that I was just talking about. The conclusion is that this quantum signal processing has optimal query complexity. Uh, and it was given by this complicated function. Okay, whatever, that's great. The downside of using this algorithm, as you can see, it's a, it's a quantum walk based algorithm. And when I introduced them, I said that it had two downsides, which was you need at least n additional qubits. So if you're trying to simulate a system of size n, what you would like is for your simulation algorithm to also use something like n qubits, or maybe n, uh, it can use some n cell qubits, but maybe not too many, maybe like log n or something, or some poly log n, that would be great. Using n additional qubits, maybe it's not as desirable. The other perhaps more serious issue is that it needs this computation of trigonometric functions in superposition, and these are really hard to implement as quantum circuits, and these blow up the gate counts by a lot. So 
what I think is still a very interesting open problem is what I'm, what I'm calling the best of both worlds sparse Hamiltonian simulation, where you have an algorithm that's optimal in its query complexity, so it makes the minimum number of uses of the oracle as possible, and uses a small number of ancilla bits, like if it's polylog, that's probably fine. And also, no trig functions isn't really a precise formal mathematical statement, but what I mean is just it shouldn't be doing exotic gates. It should uh, have reasonable gate complexity. Uh, so this problem is still open. I think the best way to attack it is still to, I mean, there might be many ways to do it, but I think the best way is probably still to go back to this, the beginning of this divide and conquer approach and the one that divides your Hamiltonian into D squared easy Hamiltonians and break it up into only D easy Hamiltonians. Maybe your notion of easy has to change or something, but um, I think this is perhaps one of the most interesting questions that's remaining in Hamiltonian simulation. Another interesting question, which is slightly different from the ones we've just been talking about is, uh, this table I presented, the more careful among you or the people who read better, might have noticed that there's, a, there's something about the norm of the Hamiltonian over there. And all of these complexities don't talk about the norm of the Hamiltonian, but, but they have to because the, the operator that you're trying to implement, e to the minus iht, this operator is invariant under scaling the Hamiltonian up and scaling the time down. So you can just multiply h by a factor of 1,000 and divide t by a factor of 1,000, and you know, ht remains the same. So you know, if the complexity is only dependent on dt and epsilon, what you can do is you can just push all of the time dependence into the norm of the Hamiltonian. So you have to put some kind of upper bound on some norm of the Hamiltonian. It doesn't matter which one. And all of these algorithms traditionally take the max norm, which is just the largest entry in the Hamiltonian. So by saying the max norm is one, what we're saying is all the non-zero entries in the Hamiltonian have absolute value at most one. So there's good reasons for this assumption. Well, I mean, for considering this specific norm. So the choice of norm is not pinned down by this argument that says that it should be scale invariant, only that you have to use some norm. Uh, there's good reasons to study the max norm, but another norm that's very interesting, I mean, in fact, if I was just talking about Hamiltonians or, and norms of Hamiltonians, people would think of the spectral norm. So what can we do with when you know that the spectral norm of the Hamiltonian is less than one? So in particular, this implies that the largest entry in the Hamiltonian is at most one, because you can figure that out. But I think this is an interesting open problem for Hamiltonian simulation because we don't have tight upper and lower bounds. What we know is there are two different algorithms that scale like either d to the 2 3rd or d to the 3 4th. Uh, one of them has better scaling in D, the other has better scaling in epsilon. But, and there's a very easy lower bound you can show of root D, and I think root D is the right answer. So I think this is one of the interesting open problems remaining, which is what can you do when you have a bound on the spectral norm? And I, I think root D is the right answer. So I'm gonna say find an algorithm with root D dependence on, on sparsity. And let me motivate why you would care about this. And there's at least two interesting reasons. Uh, one is this problem that's called the black box simulation of unitaries problem. It's exactly the same as the Hamiltonian simulation problem, but in fact, it's the more, the more natural problem from a discrete computer science perspective, which is, the problem is the following. I have a unitary in mind that I want to implement on my quantum computer. So there's no Hamiltonian, there's no time evolution, whatever, there's just a unitary in my mind. And it's sparse, so it's kind of easy. How quickly can you do that? So I have, a, I have a way of computing all the non-zero entries of this unitary. Um, I have some efficient description of this unitary in my mind. How quickly can you do this? And this problem is exactly, uh, is reducible to this problem of simulating Hamiltonians with norm at most one. Uh, the norm condition comes from the fact that unitaries have norm one. So this, I think, is a fundamental problem that's still open. Uh, the same gaps exist for this problem. We, we don't know what the right answer is between d to the two-third and root d. Uh, another interesting problem maybe with applications in mind is this quantum linear systems problem. So this is the um, HHL algorithm, if you've heard of this. Uh, I won't explain what it does or anything. I'll just say that as complexity scales like, the, or the best version of these linear system solver, solving algorithms, they scale linear in the sparsity of the, of the matrix that you're trying to solve. So you're trying to solve a linear system of equations, AX equals B, A is a matrix, it's D sparse. So it scales linearly in the sparsity, linearly in kappa, which is the condition number of the matrix, and logarithmically in the, the epsilon parameter. So this is great, except if you improve this uh, Hamiltonian simulation with bounded spectral norm to order root D, uh, I think you can massage the solution to get a solution for the linear systems problem with better query complexity. It should go down to root D. And another reason why I think root D is the right answer is that in some very recent work with uh, Aram Harrow, we were able to prove a lower bound which goes like root D times kappa times log one or epsilon. So 
because the lower bound gives you root D, I mean, doesn't necessarily mean that's the right answer, but um, I, I think this is, that's right, probably the right expression. The, like, the lower bound is closer to the truth, and we just need to improve upper bounds. And one way of doing that is by going through this Hamiltonian simulation of bounded spectral norm. Okay, and finally, let me just mention one other open problem. This one is not about query complexity. It's a more, and a more tangible, more, more about just the total number of gates needed to simulate the time dynamics of a system. And this is related to the gate complexity of a very simple Hamiltonian. So people over the years have asked me this question many times, which is just consider just the simplest possible Hamiltonian you can think of, which is just uh, a one-dimensional line of qubits. So they're all on a line, and it's a two-local Hamiltonian, and only the nearest neighbors interact with each other. So it's just a sum of terms where like, there's a term for one and two, two and three, three and four, and so on. Okay, it's a very simple Hamiltonian. It has n terms. It has n qubits. But all the algorithms I just talked about today, they all have gate complexity, uh, something like n squared times t, uh, or worse than this. But like, the best of them go like this. But it seems like if you want to simulate the system for constant time, you shouldn't need n squared gates, because really, well, A, nothing's really happening in constant time with this Hamiltonian. But it's, it's reasonable to expect a linear number of gates. You, you need to touch all of the qubits, and all the qubits need to evolve with time. But n squared sounds like a lot. And like these circuits will have uh, depth n. It seems like you don't really need depth n to propagate time dynamics of such a you know, simple looking Hamiltonian. But uh, I don't know any better way of doing this. Um, and I think this is yeah, an interesting open problem. Just what is the gate complexity? If I had to conjecture, I'd say it's something like order n times t. But um, I, I don't know. And uh, yeah, if you have any ideas, please let me know. OK, and these are the open problems I want to talk about. Uh, finally, let me just spend 30, minute, 30 seconds advertising something uh, that my group and Microsoft's working on. We were, they're working on a new quantum programming language. It's going to be great. It's high level. Yeah, this, is, this is code in this new programming language for the quantum teleportation circuit. Um, it's going to let you uh, write, write software like us theorists design algorithms, you know, call subroutines and so on, like call, things, like call Grover search as a subroutine or call Hamiltonian simulation as a subroutine, because that's how we think about algorithm design. And it's going to be available soon. Uh, it'll be free to download. It integrates with Visual Studio. Uh, you can simulate it on a laptop, that kind of thing. Um, uh, yeah, and it's, I think it's going to be great. And you can find more information on this website. All right, thanks. Uh, questions? Hey, so um, in sort of practical applications of these algorithms, one thing that I've run into in the past is that uh, for the product formulas, because they often end up having a spectral norm in the bound, it's often possible to special, if you're interested in just simulating certain states, you can often tighten the bound substantially. So for instance, if you're starting in a state of fixed particle number manifold and all the terms in the Hamiltonian conserve particle number, then you really don't need to be concerned with the you know, eigenvalues of states that are um, you know, in a different particle number manifold. And this often means you can just look at the spectral norm of one block of the Hamiltonian, which is often much, sometimes asymptotically smaller. However, with um, the LCU approaches and a lot of the quantum walk approaches, you often have this induced one norm of the Hamiltonian that enters, which is just, you know, it seems like this normalization factor. And it doesn't seem like it's possible to take advantage of those symmetries in these algorithms. So I'm wondering if you think this is sort of a fundamental property of those algorithms, or if this is, in principle, something that could be improved in the future. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Let me just rephrase the question in my, my, my words just for everyone. Uh, the question is basically, if your Hamiltonian has like some, uh, you know, think of it, it breaks up into subspaces, and there's one subspace in which it has high energy, but in one it's low energy, but all your input states lie in the low energy subspace. Your simulation's always going to stay in this low energy subspace. Can we use this fact to reduce the complexity? And it doesn't look like the, the, these approaches with LCU or quantum signal processing do that. Um, and I'm not aware of any way of doing this, but I think it's a great question. And yeah, now that you mentioned it, that, that's an excellent question that I should have included in my open problems. Yeah. Thanks. Um, with regard to the, you know, N n to 2n, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, number of qubits required. It looks like uh, the Zagetti type quantum walks uh, are the main reason, right? Or is that, 
Um, you know, so they use two copies of the number of vertices. Uh, so I'm just wondering if uh, Belov's work, which uh, kind of simplifies this a little bit, uh, I don't know if you've thought of, you know, looking into that. Uh, Belov's the, work, yeah, does it, does it reduce the, the size of the qubits, I mean, size of the registers you need? Um, not sure, so which specific work of Belov's are you referring to? Uh, so, I, uh, I can't remember the name of the paper, but uh, it's Just basically, he improves two things, I think. So one of them is that, you know, Zagedi type one walks require you to start in the um, ground, I'm sorry, the stationary state of the, uh, the corresponding quantum state of the right. stationary state of the Markov chain, right? Z um, Belov kind of gets rid of that part, and then, um, um, you know, you also don't have to know the, the graph in, in advance. You can kind of, um, um, but, but right. I'm just wondering if, uh, I think the, the number of qubits also gets improved. The, the, the walk takes place on the graph plus a few more vertices, but not the, twice the size. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll, well, I'll, I'll have to look at that work. Um, it, it means possible, I mean, that you don't need to store both vertices. I mean, all you need to store is one vertex and a register telling you which neighbor, and that's only a register of size log D. But uh, yeah, I haven't seen any implementation that actually makes it work with that for this class. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look into Bellows' thing and see if it can be done. Hey, Robin. Uh, great talk. Thanks a lot. Um, one comment I wanted to make is um, another problem that I've that I've always uh, I've always seen is just the way that error ends up scaling is fundamentally different between the say product formula approximations and the uh, uh, all of the post trotter approaches. In that, you know, say you have a Hamiltonian that consists of commuting terms, but you know, you your oracle doesn't necessarily tell you that all those terms commute. With the trotterized decomposition, the error is zero but you have to pay logarithmic cost with the other methods in order to make the error small. So, you know, um, I, I think that figuring out whether or not there's inter methods can interpolate between the two is an interesting question. Right, yeah, that's a great question. And yeah, if I can rephrase that, um, none of the techniques other than the product formula approaches actually scale better when you know that the Hamil all the terms commute. So if all the terms of the Hamiltonian commute, you can just simply do each of them individually, and then you'll just get optimal scaling, obviously. Uh, that's clearly the best thing you can do when every, everyone commutes. Just think of them as independent problems. But all, uh, other than the Trotter formulas where you can take advantage of this fact, none of the other ones have this feature. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Can we use these newer techniques? Uh, can these newer techniques exploit this fact that when things commute, things get easier and uh, I guess degrade gracefully back to this trivial solution? Yeah, I think it's a great question, but I don't think we know the answer to that. So one more question. Hi, great talk. Uh, so I wanted to just ask about the, the query bounds you showed, which are great results, obviously, but clearly they're asymptotic. Uh, and you know, especially for early quantum computers, uh, constants matter. Uh, and secondly, obviously, recombination cost is just as important, and in some cases can be larger than the query complexity. So I, I was wondering if you have any sense of, say, when uh, these, you know, at what point these more sophisticated algorithms do give, say, gate count advantages? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the last sentence? Uh, yeah, so what, what kind of scale, say, 100 qubits, 1,000, or, or a particular problem, where these more sophisticated methods actually give lower gate counts? Uh, As a, so asking about the constants, basically. Th okay, that, that's, that's a great question. Like, you know, what, what are the actual constants like, and how does it scale for uh, you know, a specific Hamiltonian you consider? And I'm going to answer that question with a 45-minute talk that's the next talk. So that talk will answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, yeah, I'll let Andrew do that. So let's move to the next talk. Let's thank our speaker. All right, thanks. <laughs>